very, very much. It has truly, it's been a truly blessed birthday. I can say that. I got to, uh, had a, a great outing last night and then got to spend time uh, with a friend who's in the hospital today. So it's been great. I almost don't want to leave New York. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> but but I have to go home tomorrow. <laughs> got got to go back to work. Uh, but good evening, everyone. We are going to uh, get right into our Bible study tonight. It is 10 p.m. Uh, Eastern time and uh, the uh, associated times across this nation. Uh, let us go uh, into prayer. God in heaven, we praise, we bless you, we glorify you, for you alone are worthy. We thank you for all of your grace and mercy that you've bestowed upon us over these past few weeks of storms and earthquakes and fires. But yet, Lord, you've allowed us to still be here another day. And so, Lord, we say thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you've allowed us one more time to come and sit at your feet. We ask now, Lord, that you open our minds, our hearts, and our understanding that we may know what it is the Spirit has to say to the church. Help us now to be your true disciples, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for um, for joining on tonight. Uh, I, I'm excited about what God is doing in and through us and what God can do as we draw closer to him. Uh, tonight we began... Uh, the, the past few nights, we, we, we started talking about why we were going to study the introduction, but now we're actually in Hebrews, and you've, you've had assignments for uh, each day leading up to tonight uh, that with, with questions that you were supposed to answer, and I trust that uh, people have, that you've done your homework and uh, ready to join in. Um, I won't go down every question, but... Uh, if you've had uh, in, in the course of your studies and uh, reviewing chapter one, if some questions have uh, raised up for you, uh, we can uh, kind of touch those now before I go into full discussion. So I guess I'll ask, uh, are there any anyone that has any questions or comments? If you're viewing it live on uh, online, you can join uh, via call, call in by calling 712-432. 0075 um, and then use code 226752. That's 712 432 0075 um, code 226752. Uh, if you want to join that way. Otherwise, uh, are there any questions? Any um, any other questions on each, each day um, raised? You have any concerns about? Yeah. Go ahead. Was that a yes or a no? No. Oh, that was a no? No questions? Okay. Perfect. Nice to have everybody that's at the top of the class. <laughs> All right, so let's go, let's go right into it. So so we understand that um Hebrews, as uh, from my previous lessons, Hebrews, um, the authors are known. He's written, written to a group of believers who are um, in danger or um, he's concerned about them possibly going back into uh, Judaism or uh, apostasy. In other words, falling away from the faith, uh, which is that of following after Christ. And so in order to uh, present his case to them and to keep them uh, to keep their attention or, or, or to encourage them to stay faithful, the author begins, uh, I, I think, very eloquently with chapter one, where he presents uh, Christ as the God man, uh, Christ in his deity. Uh, he, he presents he presents uh, how um, he is sent from God uh, to fulfill uh, and reveal to fulfill everything that God had promised and to re reveal God to us. Um, he begins this approach um, in verses in Hebrews uh, one chapter one verses one through four, uh, where he introduces the book. Um, he basically comes in and um, he he basically puts it like this: What God started, He also finished. Uh -huh. 
and and that's that's really the most legitimate part about it. He 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 begins to do like this back and forth dance. He he uh, it, he says that God has revealed God's self through the prophets, and in the, in the supreme fashion, God is now being revealed through Christ. Um, God's God began. Uh, God the Father began uh, helping us to understand who He was through um, the various uh, rituals and practices that were given to the priests and the prophets that that we find in the Hebrew Bible. Um, which is also referred to as the Old Testament. And then we find uh, that when we get to the New Testament, God then reveals God's self through Christ, his life, ministry, death, and resurrection. God the strip, uh, ex uh, explains his love toward us. Uh, one of the things I want you to note is that uh, the Bible never assumes that it is dealing with religion. Uh, uh, faith in Christ. Uh, belief in uh, God has nothing to do with religion. Uh, and I say that because uh, religion is a social, cultural construct. Uh, it, is, it has nothing to do with the Bible. Uh, the Bible is about faith. Uh, it's about faith in God, uh, while, while its religion is more about human ideas about God. What humanity uh, persons believe, this is what God likes, this is what God doesn't like, this will please God, you know, these kind of things. Uh, and, and, and in doing so, the people in the Bible that we read about, uh, they did what they did. They sacrificed, they prayed, they did other religious, um, uh, other, other actions, other uh, rituals and things, not because they wanted to please God, but they do it out of obedience to God. And that's really what this book of Hebrews is about, is, is trying to convince people how important it is to be obedient to God uh, as opposed to being religious in God. Uh, and, and, and so the, the author of Hebrews identifies two great events in which God is revealed. The first is in the Old Testament period of revelation and climax in the ministry of the prophets. And then secondly, is the great act in which God is revealed through uh, Christ. Uh, very, very different from other uh, religions or faith groups. Uh, Christianity differs in the sense that um, we believe that God is revealed through the Old Testament and through the life of Christ, and that's it. Uh, not through some other uh, man who says he was sent to the desert and or uh, any other being or entity, that we believe that Christ is the final re uh, revelation of God, uh, that where, where Christ stopped that, you know, we pick up in understanding God and following after him, but God has fully revealed itself. As a matter of fact, when the disciples say to Jesus, show us the father. And he says, when you see me, you seen the father, that he becomes the embodiment of who, uh, who the father is and what, what, what the, um, the whole uh, notion of Trinity, uh, represents for us. That that's why John says, that 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 he became flesh and dwelled among us. That that because uh, uh, we believe that 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 God, the God God is a spirit, and the humanity is flesh. In order for uh, God to fully deal with the human issue, that that um, there had to be a part of. Uh, of God that came and dwelt among and actually dealt with what we were dealing with. And so, uh, so God sent his spirit through Jesus, the reveal, he became the incarnate Christ in, in order to live with us and, and to experience what we did, but also to die for us because the, 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 uh, the law was given uh, when, when God says to Adam that if you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. Uh, in other words, basically, as Paul puts it, the wage of sin, the cost of sin is death, which meant that somebody had to die to cover the sin debt. And therefore, Jesus has died. And so what the writer in Hebrews does in introducing in chapter uh, in chapter one is that uh, he, he's basically trying to get us to understand that Christ is the fulfillment of all that God has promised. And he's the true and complete final revelation of what God, uh, uh, who, of who God is. 
and, and how we ought to interact and, and to be obedient to him. Now, let us, uh, let's, let's go to a couple of the questions. Um, uh, day two, I uh, ask you to focus on uh, verses one through two. And the question is, what is the spiritual condition of human beings that is implied by these verses? In other words, why was it necessary for Christ to be revealed the way these verses say that he was revealed? So the first one is, what's the spiritual condition? Anybody? Okay, it was not good. Why was it not good? Okay, so he, so they're asking what was the spiritual condition of humanity, and so you're saying they were they were pulling away from the faith. They were standing by your definition. Sinful. They were sinful. Okay. Anybody else? They had turned away from the, their, their teachings and they, what they believed in and began to pull away. Um, as Miss Mary said, a lot of them had began to um, walk away um, and began to doubt what God had, what they were instilled and entrusted to do. Okay. Uh, I, I think the, 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 the crust of it, um, if we look at Hebrews 1 and 2, it says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Verse 2 says, but in the last days, he had spoken to us by his son, who he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. And so what verses 1 and 2 do is basically what um, Mrs. Mary and uh, Sister Cynthia have alluded to, is that uh, they bring into light that the past issue of humanity is the same issue that we have now. In the past, it was sin. In the present, it's sin. So in the Old Testament, um, they sought out ways to deal with their sinfulness uh, in, in, in the uh, process of sacrifices and, and all the rituals they did. And in the New Testament, there was still that issue of how do we deal with the sin issue. And God solves all of that through the gift of Jesus the Christ. All right. Uh, but yeah, the main issue though was sin. Uh, and as Ms. Mary said, they were messed up. <laughs> yeah. Like like we are now. And and the I guess the irony is that you know we have the full Bible and yet we are still um not taking advantage of all that is accessible to us. So the second question in day two says, What spiritual desires for relation with Christ or Christ likeness? Do these verses awaken in your heart? Uh, that's a question on reflection. So I'm not going to ask you to uh, answer that. But uh, I want to, just in case someone hadn't really looked at these questions prior to uh, coming to tonight, that the questions that the, the questions will always precede the lesson. And you have each day of the week prior to coming to our next class to work on you and, and work through what the spirit wants to do in, in regards to these lessons. All right. So moving moving forward. Uh, so so the writer is intentional to make sure we understand that what God, uh, how God spoke to our fathers in the Old Testament. He says God is speaking to us now. And then he goes to, to talk about that that when when God spoke of old, He's now speaking in the last days. And so He constantly contrasts the the past with the present. Uh, oh, and and really, it's his present, not not our present, right? So he's he again, he's talking to his uh, modern day, uh, his contemporary audience. Um, there there are several important um, implications of doctrine when we talk about this. Now, again, I said to you that the Bible is not about religion. Uh, again, that's human construct on what we believe, uh, our ideas about God. That's what religion is. Uh, and and I and I know we have so often uh, conflated Christianity with our religion, um, and a lot of times we may fill out forms and say that. But uh, one thing that 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 uh, the Bible does do is helps us develop doctrine, and uh, doctrine is really uh, um, our way of understanding God or how we live out our faith in God. 
uh, that's what our doctrine is. And so the, the first thing that, that he points out to us is that Christ Lee has fully revealed God. Um, uh, that if Christ has fully revealed God, then we come to know God and know God, know about God from Christ. So everything we need to know about God uh, and to know of God is through Christ. Paul puts it like this, that, that we see God in the face of Jesus Christ. A second implication is that no fuller and more complete revelation of God can ever be given. So any, any religion that claims to have a further uh, revelation about Christ or a New Testament witness that, that has anything else uh, that goes beyond what we have in writing uh, in the New Testament. Now, I will, I will say this. Um, the, our canons only have 66 books, but there are other books uh, which are considered intertestamental, or uh, some Bibles will call it apocrypha. Uh, those are the books that happen in between the Old Testament writing and the New Testament writing. And they are as, as authentic and as legitimate, I believe, as the ones that are can canonized. Um, the, the, the challenge of the Bible being canonized and, the, and what went in and what did not was more political mm -hmm. Uh, in some respects, that it was uh, uh, that it had to do with faith. And so, if you ever take a, a opportunity and get a Bible that has the Apocrypha in it and read uh, Maccabees one and two, you'll find a lot of similarities with what you find in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. The same thing with uh, several of the other writings that are in the Apocrypha. And then it is really good reading. Uh, it's just that. Um, we have uh, we ascribe primarily to these 66 books, but I don't want you to get uh, so locked into just those books because those the books in between so they have they give information or fill in some gaps. As a matter of fact, to to let you know that they are really legitimate, if you ever read the book of Kings, Chronicles, uh, and First and Second Samuel, there are often times when they talk about various kings, uh, particularly in Kings and Chronicles, it talks about the life of a king. And they'll they'll say, well, he he did this, he lived, he he was he was a good king or a bad king, and then he died, and then they say the rest of the acts are written in the book of in the in the in the book of of, of the kings or the book of 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 um, I forget the other the book of the law, and so there are several. So if what 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 you'll find in the Old Testament is they'll reference these other books that are intertestamental. So you can go back and check that later. But the thing, I, the point I wanted to make is that uh, historic Christianity has always reflected the claims of those whose prophecy moved beyond the revelation of God from, uh, found in Christ. So uh, we, we've rejected those claims. Anybody that comes up and says that, you know, I'm the new Christ or I got a new revelation and stuff, that is dangerous territory. Uh, and and we've seen the fruits of that in so many so many ways. Uh, when, when you think about Jim Jones and some of these other uh, persons who have led people astray by by saying that they had uh, some new revelation or or they came to to do something uh, more or better than what Christ did. Uh, likewise, so any any faith uh, a group that that does that goes beyond that as well cannot authentically call themselves Christian, okay? So our self-definition, our identity, stands and falls with Jesus as the full and final revelation of God. One of, one of the big issues, uh, if, if you've done any study about uh, uh, the, the writings of the Apostle Paul, uh, Paul was always faithful, uh, but he was faithful to God the Father. His issue was he could not believe that the father who was so omnipotent, so uh, omnipresent, that, that had all this power, would send his son in a manger uh, to some poor folk uh, to, li to live among uh, uh, fishermen, uneducated people, and call himself the Messiah. Uh, it, it just didn't make sense to Paul. And because it didn't make sense, he became a persecutor of the church. And, and and it is as you know it, when he's u utilizing his his uh, Roman name as Saul, uh, he's a persecutor of the church. 
And it is when he, and, and you know the story, how he comes in contact with the Messiah, uh, with Jesus on the road to Damascus and begins to use his Greek name. Contrary to popular demand, his name was not changed. He just started using a different language. He focused more with his Hebrew than he did with his Greek. He became, he, Paul, is, Paul is his Hebrew name and Saul is his Greek name, Roman or Greek name. And so when he, when he became um, a, a believer of the Lord Savior Jesus Christ, he then acquainted himself with his Hebrew name uh, because he now said, you know, it's basically saying, I've, I've, I, I know who the Messiah is. And that's what the Hebrew faith was all about. Uh, whereas uh, the Greek uh, in that time, they were more about what they could see, what they could feel, what made sense. And Paul basically said, I'm going back to the old way because ain't nothing happening now going to make sense. It don't make sense that I'm walking on a road going to persecute a church and I hear a voice, but don't see nobody. That don't make sense. And so Greek just can't explain it. It don't make sense that that all of a sudden I can see well and now I'm blind. It don't make sense that he's telling me to go to somebody's house who knew I was coming to persecute them, but they opened their door anyway and ministered to me. None of this that's happening now makes sense. And since it don't make sense, let me go back to something that didn't make sense. Let's go back to the Hebrew way because I can't explain this in Greek. And so he begins to use the name of Paul. And we know him in the New Testament then as, as, the, as a New Testament writer. But his focus was initially as Saul is that he did not believe in Jesus. And, and honestly, there are so many things that can cause us to fall astray where, where we will claim that we believe in Jesus, but I actually say something different. Uh, we can't claim uh, a faith in Jesus and still not love our neighbor. We can't claim faith in Jesus and not be willing to forgive, not be willing to uh, honor uh, one another and honor those in leadership. We have to follow, because if you recall that what, what Jesus does in his teaching is that he doesn't directly attack those who are in leadership, but what he does is point out what's wrong with the system and he shows a better way. So often all we do is point out what's wrong, but we don't have no answer for how to make it better, you know? So he always, he, he, he didn't just point out the wrong, but he says, you say this, but I say this. You know, he, he always gave them an alternative for how they ought to, how they ought to live in uh, the better way uh, that, was, that was given to him by the Father. Amen. So um, day four asks you to focus on Hebrews 5 through 7, verses 5 through 7. And then it asks, how do you discover that most of the words in the focus verse are quotations from the Old Testament? So how do you know that they are quotations from the Old Testament in verses five through seven? That's an easy question. How do you know they're quotations? If you got a good Bible, they probably, uh, they're written a different way, right? Instead of straight across as the verses one through four, they are, they are written almost like, uh, you know, uh, like in a po poetic form. Uh, they got quotation marks around them. Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> I told y'all that was easy. So they got quotation marks around them to, to indicate that these are not a part, you know, he's bringing this from somewhere else. It belongs some to, to some other, uh, somebody else gets credit for this. And so, um, so the next one says, as if, if, as verse six states, angels worship Christ, what should our daily response to Jesus be? So verse six says, and again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. So if angels worship Christ, what should our response be? Okay. And what and 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 what does worship look like? How do we worship? And in obedience and in praise. That's it, Miss Mary. Worship is not just, you know, showing up at church on Sunday and throwing your hands up in the air and singing songs, but it's a life. It, it is a, a, a life of obedience uh, to do the will 
of God uh, and following the works of Christ. Uh, it's about obedience. It is not a song you sing. It is not a dance. Uh, it, it is not a, a, a something you read or chant or whatever. It is a life that is completely dedicated and committed to the will of God uh, through the life of Christ. Uh, that, that's what worship is all about. It's, is recognizing that that I am here because of what he has already done. And if anything good comes out of my life, it'll be because of God working through me. Uh, I, I love the song we used to sing uh, when I was in youth choir. It said, Jesus is the light that shineth in me. So if you, if you see any good, if there's any, any light that shines, it's because Jesus is shining through, not because I am the light, but that he is the light. Amen. All right, so um, the next passages, uh, I want to make sure I get to everything before my time is up. Um, so so um, I, I mentioned earlier about the intertestamental books, um, and you'll, you'll find it if you read this lesson that I, I mentioned some of that about it, so I'm not going to spend uh, any more uh, focusing on that, but if you have questions, about those, uh, we can uh, discuss them at a later time. Uh, so the opening verses basically introduce us to who Christ is. And then the next following verses kind of break it down for us. So, so when verse four finished the opening sentence and introduced the theme of the following verses, Christ has basically become the superior to the angels uh, as the name in which he is inherited is more excellent than theirs. And so the writer of Hebrews basically takes the rest of of um, the next few verses to to really point out how Christ is superior to the angels. He he he, he starts out, and, and anybody know why this is important? Why does he make have to point out Christ's superiority to the angels? And he starts with angels. Why is that important? Anybody? Come on, y'all think about it. So we're talking, so he, remember now the next few verses, he quotes Old Testament passages and the book of Hebrews is, is very steeped in uh, Old Testament uh, ideology and theology. And so as he begins, this writer begins to make his case to his audience. He starts out, first of all, by saying that Christ is the revelation, the full and final revelation of God, that this is, God has revealed God's self for the last time through Christ. He fulfills all, and he's the final revelation. And then he says, and now he's superior to the angels. Why, why is it important to point out the superiority of Christ over angels? Anybody? Anybody watching? Because the angels are supposed to worship God, worship Christ. Okay, so so right when he when he talks about angels worshiping Jesus Christ, it's a part to make that argument. But why is is that um, important? Because higher than they are, above all, all all else, and higher than they are. I'm saying also the angels, Jesus God's son, angels will not use children. Right. That that that's all all a part of that argument. And uh, Sister Barnes, uh, you said to ensure that we do not worship angels. Uh, that that's a good um, good response as always. Um, also, here here's the thing: the New Test, the Old Testament was steep with angelic presence. Uh, if you if you recall Genesis, uh, it talks about the uh, the children of of Anakin, wherein angels came down and had babies. By, by because they saw the women were, were beautiful and they had children by them. There was a, there was a consistent angelic presence, and and so people, you know, even today we talk about garden angels, guardian angels, and and my angel uh, is, you know, I, you have, see people wearing angels on their shoulders and all this kind of stuff. And and here, let me just say this: the the thing that people wear on their shoulders, that's not an angel, that's a cherubim. We, we call it an angel because it is a heavenly being, but it's a cherubim. An angel, if you read in the Bible, whenever the word angel is mentioned, such as Michael and uh, uh, Michael the archangel, I'm trying to remember the others, 
Uh, but basically, they were actual men. They didn't have wings. They were, and so when you hear, when you read in Genesis, I, I think it's around Genesis uh, three, four, uh, four and five, where where they where they where they come down and and they are having intercourse with the women. These were not no 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 flying beasts. These were actual men that walked around, and that's where we get you know they said that's where the giants came from or whatever. Uh, but because they had special powers and they had special insight, um, you remember uh, Abraham is visited by an angel and Lot is visited by an angel. Thank you, uh, uh, Reverend Young. Gabriel was one of the angels. Gabriel shows up in the New Testament. Uh, so they, they had this angelic presence and anything was considered out of worldly, they tend to want to worship, want to bow down to it. And the angels have to constantly tell them, no, don't worship me. Just do this. Just follow this and all of that. And so because uh, we as human beings are always, we are created to worship. Let's get that straight. You are always going to worship something or somebody. Now, the question is, what do you worship? As humans, because God designed us as worshipers, um, we're always looking for something that's superior than what we're already worshiping. And so there were those who were still worshiping angels because they were divine beings. And they was like, well, this is close to God. So let, let's worship it. And so the writer of Hebrews says, wait a minute, I need you to understand why angels are divine beings, why they may come from heaven. They are not superior to Christ. And he goes through Hebrews chapter one, those, those next five, seven verses and lays out the case. He, he says, he says, which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? Today I have become your father. Never said that to an angel. He says, well, wow. you know, or again, I will be his father and you will be my son. And so he lays out the case to say, don't be tripping with no angels because angels ain't where your hope is. Your hope is in Christ. Um, wow. and, and I think today some of us need to hear that because, you know, we, we um, particularly as African-Americans, we can become some of the most um, superstitious or whatever cases, we're always looking for something to grab hold to. And, you know, I think I saw a lady one day that had about 10 angels on her shoulder. I'm, I'm sorry, not angels, cherubims on her shoulder. Talking about she just need to make sure that, that she being protected. And she had them all over her back. And I'm like, I'm thinking about the time it took for her to, every jacket she wears, she got to take them off one and put on the other. You know, when, when all you got to do is hide your life in Christ, you know? Uh, we used to sing a song wrapped up and tied up in the Lord. If you get wrapped up in the Lord, you ain't got to worry about no angels on your back because God's got it. You know you're protected. You know that no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. You know that no enemy that comes against you will be able to stand because he's going to lift up a standard. You know? And so I, I ain't got to put no, no, no man-made ornament on me to protect me, nor does wearing a cross protect you. You know, the cross, when we wear it, is a symbol of our faith. It's, a, it, it, it's like when you're driving down the highway and you see a, an octagon sign, even if the word stop ain't on there, you know what it means, right? And so when people walk around and they see a cross around your neck, they know what it means. That's a Christian. At least that's what it's supposed to mean. Um, you know, and so then they also look at your life to line up with it. You know, if I see, if I see you with a cross around your neck, I expect for you to be walking and acting like Christ, not, not anything else coming out of your mouth. As believers, uh, as Christians, uh, particularly um, in, in the Methodist faith, well, you know, let me let me just say it now. As Christians in general, we don't wear crucifix. Anybody know why we don't wear crucifix? Because it tells Jesus to kill us on the cross. We don't believe. We don't believe that. We believe Jesus resurrected and stay up on the cross. Amen. The crucifix is is it symbolizes him. It has him still on the cross, and our Savior. Ain't on the cross no more. He got down. He, he, he died. He was buried. He rose again. We live a resurrected life, not a, uh, a soon to be resurrected life, but, 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 the, but it has been done. It, it, it is finished. Uh, so we're, we're not relying, we're not, we're, not, we're not relying on Mary to pray for us or, or angels to guide us because he is our guide and he is our example. Amen. All right, so so we we so he spends his time making sure that they know that Christ is superior to angels, and and the next verses uh, 
he goes down and and at verse 10 and he comes back and he says in the beginning the lord laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens and and the work of their hands and they will perish but you remain and so in the next verses he begins to to lay out um of uh, the whole foundation of christ of how his his legacy will continue forever where everything else heaven and earth will pass away um but 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 christ will stand forever he made him an eternal seat and he now sits at the right hand of god uh, so angels basically exist for our sake get this but we exist for christ's sake and angels are servants of god sent to work for him and part of their work is done for those people uh, 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 uh about to inherit salvation right but 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 we don't work for them in essence they are working on our behalf so angels do exist but if we have christ we ain't got to worry about the angels because christ is superior to the angels uh they they are servants and and get this they don't inherit eternal life they don't they don't get salvation you know um anybody know of, of of an angel that has missed out on salvation there you go <laughs> satan lucifer was an angel and 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 the bible talks about him being a beautiful angel had a, a beautiful voice and um he exalted himself above god the father it was like oh that's what you're doing i can do that um, I, I saw a post uh, on Facebook today uh, where somebody wrote uh, about it said two two jobs that people watch somebody do and then they said oh I can do that because it look easy and the two were a comedian and a preacher <laughs> they sit back and study other folk do it and say I can do it and then when I when I saw that I thought about uh, the lesson I said you know I guess that's what Satan was doing he was standing back you know, in the pray with the praise team, watching what was going on in heaven, he said, "Oh, I could run this a whole lot better than this. I could do this." And he gets kicked out. And but when he gets kicked out, he pulls uh, a third of the heaven with him. You know, so he pulls some angels down with him. So he has his angels. And uh, I, I said Sunday in my sermon, you know, uh, that there are other spirits other than the Holy Spirit. So you got to be quite, be careful about which spirit you say you're following, and make sure it's a spirit that glorifies God. Verses 8 and 9 are quotes from Psalms 45. Uh, someone read Psalms 45, please. My heart is stirred by a noble thing. As I recite my verses for the king, my tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. You're the most excellent of men, and your lips have been anointed with grace. The God has blessed you forever. Bird your sword on your side, you mighty one. Clothe yourself with splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride forth victoriously. In the cause of truth, humility, and justice, let your right hand achieve awesome deeds. Let your sharp arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemies. That the nations fall beneath your feet. Your throne, O oh God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate weakness. Therefore, God, your God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. All your robes are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and pasture, from palaces adorned with ivory. Music of the strength makes you glad. Daughters of kings are among your honored women. At your right hand is the royal bride and the gold of open pearl. Listen, daughter, and pay careful attention. You get your people and your father's house. Let the king be enthralled by your beauty. Honor him, for he is your lord. The city of Tyre will come with a gift, for wealth will seek your favor. All glory, prince. Within her chain, her gown is interwoven with gold, and embroidered garments she is bearing to the king. 
her virgin companions follow her. Those from with her, led in with joy and bless, they enter the palace of the king. Their sons will take the place of your father. You will make them princes throughout the land. I will perpetrate your memory to all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So uh, this is a wedding song. What about this psalm does the writer of Hebrews find necessary to help solidify his claim about Christ? Why, why does he? Why do you think he picks this song? Well, he says in verse eleven, "Let us that they will perish, but remain. They will, will all wear out like a garment." Okay. Anybody else? So I, I um I think that the key is found in in Psalm forty five verse six, which is what he quotes, and when he says, "Your throne will last forever and ever," uh, that's in essence what what God the Father says to um, uh, Christ the Messiah, that because of his obedience, because of his uh, willingness to to do what what the Father requires. That, that his throne will last forever, that he will be. That's why we say that, that he's king of kings and lord of lords, um, everlasting. Uh, and, and so that verse, uh, Psalms 45 and 6, Psalms 45 verse 6 basically applies to that, um, that his scepter will last forever, that his kingdom will never end. Um, and, th and this comes also as a fulfillment to the promise that God gives David. Uh, when he promises him that his kingdom will live on. How does that fulfill the divinic promise? Anybody? Uh, how, how, Jesus Christ? how so? Exactly. So Jesus comes from the line of David. And and when when uh, the promise is that David's throne will last forever, uh, it doesn't mean that David is going to live forever, nor his children, but a seed, a descendant of his, lives forever, and and that seed is is Jesus, who was born of Mary and uh, and the son of Joseph, and because of that, you know the uh, he becomes from the line of David and then the kingdom. David's line lives forever. And so basically what these verses point out to us is that uh, that God is intentional about keeping his promises. And uh, it doesn't matter how long it takes him to get it done. It doesn't, know, not, it doesn't matter how long, uh, even if it seems impossible to do. Uh, you would think, you know, um, even even uh, like like Paul, many of us would probably have been skeptical about this virgin who all of a sudden comes up pregnant out of nowhere and talking about she pregnant with the Savior. Yeah, yeah, right. OK. I mean, can you imagine somebody like that showing up at church? Some young girl, because, again, remember, she's a teenager, maybe 12, 13 years old. And now she's pregnant. And, and you know, and she claimed I don't, she ain't seen no man. OK, right. Nobody would believe that. So. So it became so impossible, so unbelievable. But what I've learned in my few years on this earth is that God takes the impossibilities of our life and makes things possible. He takes the unbelievable things in our life and make them believable. And a matter of fact, he loves it when things get to that point, when we can't believe it, when we can't understand it, when, when we deem it to be impossible. And, and Christ is a fulfillment of that that God specializes in doing things that seem impossible. Uh, it did not seem that the consciousness of a person who sins could ever be cleansed. Uh, the sacrifice of the Old Testament did not do it. Didn't matter how many bulls and goats they sacrificed, didn't matter how much they, they, they uh, repented or asked for forgiveness, the memory of it, the sting of it still remained. It is only when one accepts Christ as their full, full um, as their Savior and accepts the forgiveness that is offered through the gift of the Holy Spirit that our consciousness is purged. That that even though we may remember the things that have happened to us and the things we've done, 
the guilt of it is removed. Can anybody reckon, remember when you had something that you had done that just used to, you couldn't sleep at night, that it just worried you, you were so guilty about it, even worried that eventually somebody's going to find out and, you know, I'm going to be busted or whatever. But when you turn it over to Jesus, when you when you gave your life to Christ and began to live an obedient life and the Holy Spirit cleansed your conscience of it, then you don't even worry about it no more. To the point that even if folk find out about it, it ain't no big deal, you know, because it's already been covered. You know, the, the, sad, the tragedy in that is that while God forgives us and while the Holy Spirit purges our consciousness, humans will still hold things against us. But, I, you know, I hold true today that even though folks may remember something I may have done, said or whatever, the reality is I like the f fact that they can say I used to or I did it in the past. You can't, you can't, you can't assign that to me now. That's not who I am now. Because Paul says if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creature. And the old are passed away and behold, everything has come new. And so the writer of Hebrew invites us today to accept Christ accept the newness that he brings, accept the authority that he brings, and not fall for any okie doke any other testimony, any other revelation, any other being or entity that tries to exalt itself above the Father, above Jesus, above the Holy Spirit, and recognize that there is only one true and living God, and it is manifest to us through the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is our Savior, the full, the human, uh, he came as a human being to reveal God to us. And so now our responsibility is to receive him as a son of God, to accept the gift of salvation that he offers and open our hearts for the Holy Spirit to come in, to teach, guide us and to cleanse us so that we can fully and wholeheartedly worship and serve him. To do anything else is to be outside of the will of God and to, and to not have the benefit of the gift that God has promised. Is there any, are there any questions or, uh, or comments? For this lesson tonight. Any questions or comments? Well, I had a comment. Um, I love how the scripture and you uh, really tied in this superiority of Jesus, along with the um, how the angels are not um, eternal. Uh, the broom, you know, this shelf will be established forever, mm -hmm. and only Jesus will be able to sit on that throne because he is eternal. That's right. And they, you know, they cannot because they are not. And, uh, and so the scripture really, you know, um, not only does it state, but it also validates it. And when you tied it back, you know, to Psalm, it was that bridge uh, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Amen. 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 Thank you, uh, Dr. Cox, for that. Uh, I would uh, highlight the last uh, question, which is on the sixth day, and it asks, if the role of angels is to serve, what role do you suppose we are called to fulfill? Anybody? We are called to be a servant just like the angels. Okay. Who are we serving? Mankind. Serving each other. Okay. And, and our master. Well, actually, we serve each other and we worship God. Um, we are called to serve each other. If you recall, uh, after Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, um, he takes his... Uh, garment off. Remember, he begins to wash the disciples' feet and, and he tells them that, you know, you've got to do likewise for each other. That um, if you, those who would be lead, the, the greatest among you must be the servant. We are called to serve one another and worship God. Uh, we don't worship each other. We serve each other. We don't worship the angels. Uh, the angels serve us. We serve each other. And we all worship God. Amen. Amen. All right. So next week we will um, move on to uh, let, uh, chapter two. Um, I need to make sure you all, there are questions on page 11 uh, or chapter two, the, the reflections and discussion before you get into the, before we actually discuss it. So it, it is important.
that you do that so that I don't have to work so hard that y'all can talk back to me. All right. Um, if there are there any other questions or comments? All right. Uh, hearing none, let me say thank you to all of you that are joining tonight. And uh, we're going to close out with prayer. Uh, God in heaven, we praise and bless you for this glorious night that you've given us. We thank you for the study of your word. We thank you for the revelation of Christ. We thank you now that we are called to serve each other. And it is in serving others that you are revealed through us. And so, Lord, we thank you now. We ask that we become fully your disciples as we draw nearer to you. We bless you now. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Good night, everyone. Good night. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.